Hi, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well and staying safe. I want to thank you all for joining us today for this talk organized by McCann in collaboration with Uprooted and Rising. So McCann is a Palestinian-led educational nonprofit which works to strengthen voices for Palestinian rights. We host these talks to create a space where we can bring people together to hear insights from expert speakers on issues related to Palestine and human rights more broadly, and to engage in critical thought-provoking conversations and safe, in a safe community space. Today, we are very excited to be joined by Justine Tiba and Fedi Atan. Thank you both so much for joining us. Justine Tiba is an indigenous activist who has been with the indigenous liberation organization, the Red Nation, since 2017. She is from the pueblos of Tusuki, Santa Clara, and Acoma, all tribes in the Southwest. She is currently based in occupied Tiwa territory, otherwise known as Albuquerque, New Mexico. In their time in the Red Nation, they have co-founded the Pueblo Feminist Caucus, contributed to the Red Deal, and have been a part of the majority of the campaigns, including a food sovereignty initiative starting in 2020. She has also traveled to Palestine and toured various cities in the West Bank under the Israeli occupation. Our other speaker is Palestinian chef Fadi Atan. Fadi is an authority on modern Palestinian cuisine and has featured in many international publications, including the BBC News, The Guardian, Monocle, and Lifestyle, as well as Jamie Oliver's televised exploration of the region and Jancis Robinson's travelogue. In 2015, Fadi opened his own restaurant, Fauda, in Bethlehem, where he's joining us from today. Fadi's approach to food is informed by his passion for sharing the stories of local foragers, gardeners, farmers, and cooks that have shaped the culinary heritage of Palestine. And I'm Pascal Payon. I work as a research associate at McCann, and I'm also doing a PhD in food and cultural studies related to the African diaspora at the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies. I'll be facilitating today's talk. So before we start the conversation with our speakers, I'm going to give a brief background on today's topic. Throughout food systems across the world, there is intense inequality and violence, both for people who work with food and for those who don't. Food raises questions surrounding power and inequalities, such as who has access to nutritious and affordable food or who gets to define their own cultural cuisine. This is why food is at the forefront of many social justice struggles, clearly highlighting issues like hunger, displacement and exploitation. In today's talk, we'll be exploring how growing, creating, and consuming food can all be political acts, particularly in colonial contexts. In these contexts, the otherwise simple act of claiming food as one's own can be seen as part of a larger act of reclaiming land, culture, and history in the face of colonial erasure. And this reclamation of culinary identity or food itself is only possible with food sovereignty, which is described as the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and people's right to define their own food and their own agricultural systems. So in short, food sovereignty puts the aspirations and needs of those who produce, distribute and consume food at the heart of food systems and policies rather than the demands of markets and corporations. Exploring food sovereignty in relation to indigenous communities focuses on indigenous people's right to control their own food systems. This includes markets, food production methods, food culture, and more. And as indigenous people live in both rural and urban areas, food sovereignty is relevant in both settings. So in order to look into the effects of colonization on cuisine, identity, and resistance, we'll be focusing on Palestinian communities and indigenous communities in occupied Tiwa territory, otherwise known as Albuquerque, New Mexico, in the southwestern part of the United States. These communities face threats of both physical and cultural erasure, as well as ongoing displacement and inequalities in their ancestral lands. In the Palestinian context, the theft of Palestinian land and the fragmentation and displacement of Palestinian communities goes hand in hand with the theft and exploitation of Palestinian culture. When it comes to food, this often appears in the inaccessibility of ingredients in agricultural land, the appropriation of Palestinian food as Israeli, and Palestinian farmers, fishers, and other food harvesters losing their livelihoods. Like all struggles for food sovereignty, the struggle for Palestinian food sovereignty is an essential part of Palestinian freedom, justice, and equality. The Native American context differs from the Palestinian context, but still faces some of the same forces of settler colonial occupation and the inherent theft and displacement that comes along with it. There are 574 federally recognized tribes in the U.S., all of whom face both historic and ongoing oppression. Along with the theft of over 90% of the land and the severe impoverishment of indigenous communities, the U.S. government 
also continues to actively suppress indigenous people, often leaving them to live in situations where nutritious food is scarce, and this is often referred to as food deserts. We'll focus on how reclaiming ownership of indigenous agriculture, cuisine, and access to food in the United States is a necessary part of reclaiming indigenous rights, sovereignty, and ultimately liberation. So with this background covered, I'd like to go ahead and start the discussion with Justine and Fedi. So before we talk about um, more specifically about food sovereignty, can you both tell us a bit about the indigenous communities you come from? So we can start with Justine for this question and then move on to Fedi. Thank you, Tamu. Um, ku to my uh, Palestinian relatives. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Justine Tiva from the pueblos of Santa Clara, Tesuki, and Acoma. And most of which the context I'm going to be speaking today will be from, um, I guess, the state of New Mexico. Um, here in New Mexico, we have, I believe, 22 tribes, and 19 of those are Pueblo tribes. Um, at the time of Spanish contact, there was over 120 Pueblo villages that had existed, and today um, I am part of three of the remaining 19. Um, and I do want to mention, too, um, here where I'm at in Albuquerque, uh, we are at 35 degrees north, and Palestine is at 31 degrees north. And so when I went to Palestine, um, it felt, it genuinely felt like home. The landscape, uh, the way that Palestine looks reminds me very much of um, taking a drive from Albuquerque to Acoma. And so, yeah, I'll pass it to Fadi. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> good evening from Bethlehem. I, we are, you know, when we talk about indigenous people here, we are very varied indigenous people. What we have to remember, and, and sadly sometimes in our own discourse, we try and say that we come from the Canaanites. But in reality, our occupation didn't start 70 years ago. We've been occupied by every civilization of the Mediterranean area, most notably the Ottomans for 400 years. And our when we look at food sovereignty and the link to land, we need to look at the diversity of the different Palestinian indigenous populations that constitute Palestinians. So we have a very nomadic part of our population, which are the Bedouins. We have a farmer gatherer population, which are the people of the hills of the West Bank, basically the, the West Bank. And then we have the coast population, in Gaza, but also in Jaffa, Haifa, Yaffa, which are the, the fishermen. And, and these are three very different relations to our environment that we're seeing with, with our link to, to food. I'm very happy that Justine just, just did do one of her last trips before the pandemic to Palestine. Um, we are in, in a very different situation, both of our people. Um, you were earlier saying that what we reminded you of is a step, a different step in, in the colonial system. Actually, I think we are in a very particular colonial um, situation because our definition of who we are by itself is being challenged. Very often we still hear in the general public discourse that Palestinians don't exist. And there's this whole amalgamation of Palestinians, Arabs, which we are Arabs because we do speak Arabic, but we're, we're Palestinians. And that's something quite clear to, that's necessary to understand, to be able to understand the difference. One of the comments I got as soon as we announced this talk was somebody saying, oh, but your food is Levantine food. We are part of the Levant, yes, but we're not, there's nothing called Levantine food. It's as if we would say there's a North American cuisine doesn't mean much. All you is Pascal. Yes, sorry. <laughs> I was trying to unmute. Um, yeah, so just uh, taking these different um, communities into consideration, what does it mean to claim or reclaim indigenous food um, cultures? So we can start with Fadi and then Justine, but Fadi, in particular, um, since you're coming at it from the Palestinian perspective, how does this play out for Palestinians? Um, so like the majority of whom are in diaspora. 
Well, the, the part is reclaiming and part is preserving. And with the diaspora, I think it's quite interesting to see with our first diasporas, the ones that left at the end of the 19th century, um, that left mainly to Latin America, um, they did not preserve the language, they did not preserve a lot of the traditions, but they did preserve the cuisine. And it is a, an essential indicator of how important, how we eat and what we eat is. Um, so if you look at the Palestinian diaspora in Chile, for example, the fourth and fifth generation Palestinians that don't speak Arabic, but they all cook traditional food. And what's very interesting in, in reclaim, reclaiming our identity in terms of cuisine um, is that a lot of recipes that have disappeared in Palestine have actually been preserved in the diaspora. Um, and today what we work on is trying to reappropriate all of these recipes into one cuisine. I'll take an example, a dish you most probably all know, knefe, which is that cheese, um, cheese and a vermicelli dessert that's done in Nablus. In Latin America, the Palestinians don't know that knefe because they left Bethlehem, mainly from the Bethlehem area, <coughs> in the 1890s where we did not do this knafa, we did a different form of knafa, which they've preserved, and we forgot, and now we're reintroducing it. Our second challenge, which applies to, to both us, and, and I would say not to both, but to all of us worldwide, is the globalization of cuisine. What we're seeing, and if I look at my sector, which is really the restaurant industry, um, we're seeing a standardization of tastes, and the dish we can all talk about, of course, is hummus. I mean, there's nothing called chocolate hummus or beetroot hummus or I, I don't know, whatever hummus. Hummus in Arabic means chickpeas. And it's, it's as simple as this. It's the usage of a word that has been transformed in the global market into a product that basically means a paste you dip in. But hummus in Arabic means chickpeas. And the, these are the examples of dishes that have been victim of globalization and i i think the for, for you that have that are in the in the united states have have seen uh around valentine's day chocolate hummus all over your supermarkets and i was just like what is this and why are we not answering this and then of course there's the level of appropriation by the israelis and and that's where it's very similar to other countries that are countries of colonial immigrant populations that go through a first phase where they deny any link to the local land and the local cuisine. But then in a search of justification, um, they go towards trying to appropriate the local cuisine as theirs. What is Israeli cuisine? I don't know. What I think is extremely dangerous is the usage of the word Jewish cuisine because there are people of Jewish faith all over the world. And if you're Jewish in Poland, your cuisine is Polish cuisine with the restriction of faith. And, and whether you're Muslim, Jewish, Buddhist, Hindu, there are restrictions on food that come with faith, but it doesn't make that cuisine not local. Um, a person who's originally from Syria, there was a very large Jewish community in Aleppo. They have the right to call Aleppo cuisine theirs, just as much as me or somebody of Samaritan, Jewish, or Muslim faith in Palestine is an owner of Palestinian cuisine. What we're seeing today worldwide is this new justification and it's very it's much shocking for chefs because today in, as chefs we attach a lot of importance towards provenance and origin of produce and bizarrely when it comes to palestinian food it's no more relevant so you see israeli chefs using frika for example which is the charred wheat that is used in palestine that is grown in palestine and transformed in palestine being called frika without 
an appellation of origin just to deny that link to Palestine. And as I, I often say, I have no problem having an Israeli chef cooking Palestinian food, but let him or her say it is Palestinian food. Because that's for me what is important in claiming not only the cuisine, but the whole story. What we have to remember as, as chefs, we do not exist without the foragers and the farmers. They are the ones that, that work hard to preserve our ecosystem. And we just we intervene with our fingers. I mean, we don't do much in a kitchen, honestly. Like we, we, we transform and modify. We do document our traditions. But the, the real fighters out there are the farmers and the foragers, are the fishermen. And with our cuisine, part of the reality on the ground between the segregation war, between the settlements and the bypass roads, is the actual physical denial of access to land. The restrictions that have been imposed by the Israelis, one of them, this, this morning there was a, an incident where a few children have been arrested in the north of the West Bank by the Israeli authorities for picking gundelia, which, which we call akub in Arabic, which is a thistle uh, that's cooked in, during this season. They were arrested on the base that they were picking it for commercial use because Israel decided illegally, because it's in the West Bank, so it's territories controlled by the Palestinians, Israel decided that we're no more allowed to forage it except if it's for personal use. They're denying livelihood of, of these foragers. And I don't, I, it's a bit of a complicated situation because I don't agree ha having, you know, 13 year old kids working as foragers, but that is the livelihood of their community. And it's being denied. Zatar, I mean, Zatar is another good example. You get things called Zatar all over the world. None of them is really Zatar. There's a funny mix of thyme and oregano that goes into making so-called Zatar, while Zatar is actually a local uh, plant. Um, it is from the family of thyme, but it's not thyme. What we're seeing in massive distribution supermarkets across the world, zatar being sold as this mix of, of unknown spices, or <clears throat> being sold as an Israeli spice. Um, what we have to remember, and I think that's essential when we try defending Palestinian heritage, Israel was created in 1948. Um, when they're claiming cuisines that have historic roots that go beyond the 2000 year mark because you know that, that's another layer of our complexity is um, we we all have um, a claim to the land that's linked to faith which is a bit of a denier of the actual real history because before 2000 years we were all pagans and we lived here, and we should not deny this here, because that is our real, my trace, my roots in this country are not limited to, we didn't start 2,000 years ago. We've been here, you know, Jericho is one of the oldest cities in the world, it's 20,000 years old. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, sorry, I, I was saying, um, yeah, I think that's uh, an important thing to to mention everything that you've uh, talked about. And some of the things that you've mentioned we'll actually go into a bit more um, later on. But um, yeah, I think I, I kind of as you were saying, um, it's probably it's part of a larger part of claiming to be Palestinian and reminding people and asserting that Palestinians do exist. Um, and of course that goes along with the food and culture as well. Um, so Justine, what, what do you think it means to claim or reclaim indigenous food cultures in um, the context that you're from? Um, okay, yeah. So just like what Fadi said, um, in in my context, a lot of um, reclaiming indigenous food cultures is about reclaiming and preserving. And that's basically the stages that we're at over here in, um, in New Mexico. Um, settler colonial or indigenous genocide is just like a basic, uh, a basic part of settler colonialism. And so I 
you know, I've and I heard this in Palestine too. Uh, our everyday existence is resistance, and uh, reclaiming that, reclaiming and preserving that knowledge is a part of that. And so, um, I um, just barely hopped into uh, food sovereignty and like getting to know the entire um, the entire world of what that means here in the pueblos uh, just last year. And so, I've uh, what I personally did was um, I started to grow, I started to plant, I started to um, grow indigenous foods. I, last spring, I planted um, Pueblo squash, corn. Um, I failed at Acoma melon. <laughs> I planted amaranth and um, let's see what else. Um, yeah, and a couple, and I, and I failed at some other squash too. <laughs> but anyways, um, and through that process, and that was a part of an initiative that the Red Nation had started um, at the beginning of the pandemic to sort of, um, to, it, it was a time, at the beginning of the pandemic, it was a time of sort of like, I guess, facing the apocalypse. <laughs> and so we hopped to action and we uh, we went and we went to Akuma and um, we met, I, I met one of my clan brothers for the first time. His name's Aaron Loudon, who does a lot of work um, for Pueblo farming in Akuma. And he gifted the Red Nation uh, a bunch of seeds. He gifted us seeds and knowledge. And uh, we took that back to Albuquerque and we began planting in our backyards. And um, let's see. And so, um, you know, preserving that seed, and keeping those seeds, these are non-GMO seeds, these are organic seeds, these are Pueblo seeds that have been evolved over time, that have been in our caretaking for, you know, time immemorial. And to continue that, that seed lineage is, um, is an act of resistance, is an act of preserving, um, you know, everything that's being trying, everything that's being torn down around us through, you know, corporate monopolies on seeds, um, it's legal to, um, to, it's illegal for certain farmers to use our seeds, you know, and so Pueblo people through our sovereignty, we are able to, um, you know, get around that, get around that part of colonialism um, that has always been implemented on Pueblo people. Um, I mentioned that I grew amaranth, uh, amaranth was was made illegal by conquistadors in Mexico and Central America, and uh, going as far as to cut off limbs of people who were caught um, um, growing amaranth and um, reclaiming um, amaranth is um, is an act of resistance because it's it reestablishes our long lost connection to um, our southern relatives in Mexico and South America, who um, who we used to have thriving trade routes with, who we, we would give um, give seeds to and exchange seeds with, and and other items as well. And so um, today those. Today, those sort of connections are being uh, rekindled and remade. I was um, just before this, just to sort of um, refresh on my uh, food sovereignty knowledge and stuff. I rewatched one of my um, good friends. His name is Jeffrey Kai. He made a video last summer called "Feeding Pope," and um, in that, he was at the Southwest International Tribal Food Summit last year or last spring, and. Um, during that, they exchanged seeds there that they said probably haven't been exchanged in our lands for over a thousand years. And so, yeah, and so we're making these like ancient connections to um, or reconnecting back to those sort of things because, and I can just be frank about, um, I guess, like indigenous food culture, <laughs> there's, um, there's the traditional food co culture is, um, I guess just not very um, where it, it, you know, we've, sorry, we've gone through like 500 years of colonization. We've lost a lot of knowledge. We lost a lot of connections. Uh, even what we consider uh, traditional foods uh, during our feast days that we serve, those are often just, um, I guess, um, just foods that we use that don't even have, um, you know, that I guess they're colonized is what I'm trying to say. You know, even our traditional foods are colonized. 
you know, we use, um, we use beef, pork, we use um, all of the, the whole spectrum of like American uh, or settler American foods. You know, I consider one of my traditional foods, um, you know, a jello dish <laughs> that, we, that we make for every few days. It's called the green stuff, you know, but, um, but much of our connection to our indigenous foods um, have, have been cut, you know, or have straight up, um been like um taken from us through like ongoing projects of colonization uh in my pueblo uh so one of the traditional foods we have is like a stew right it has a uh, corn and meat and it's a stew but the meat is replaced with beef nowadays uh traditionally it would be uh it would be deer elk bison uh these sort of like animals but um in santa clara where i'm from we can't even hunt we can't even like make good um we we, we can't even like sustain ourselves in a meaningful way with our traditional foods if we wanted to go into the mountains to hunt deer there's actually a cap of the amount of deer that we can hunt because they're contaminated with nuclear contamination from the los alamos national labs and so um and so grow, um, being surrounded in that, in colonialism and remaking these connections and sort of, um, and, and, and doing all of that work, it is the resistance that will give us a future to even have any sort of meaningful, like sustainability um within our indigenous lands and uh just had as uh fadi had mentioned that our continued resistance is dependent on our ability of you know having stewardship over the land uh, being able to caretake the land and be able to um you know basically end colonial basically the end of colonialism would be the future of indigenous people because it's the ongoing colonialism that continues to take away these things, um, continues to take away our knowledge and even limits us from having any sort of meaningful, um, you know, sustainability. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I, th I think that's also really important how you mentioned how, um, you know, how like reclaiming or claiming um, indigenous food cultures in your context, it's, um, you know, also the, the idea of claiming it as your own identity, but also at like literally reclaiming the seeds and like the the knowledge that has been like stolen from you um, and taking that, um, like incorporating that back into like your identity. I think that's really powerful. Um, also when, when you're saying the thing about, um, you know, how like a lot of indigenous foods um, have changed and how like, you know, one of the cultural foods like uses jello, I know obviously that's probably changed over the years, but at the same time, I feel like, you know, there's still, there's still, I'm sure like even like the, the stews that use a different meat now, like there's still something that's still um, like specifically indigenous in those dishes. Um, so it's kind of, I think it, it's kind of interesting to see how things develop and change over time. And, um, and that basically brings me to my next question, um, focusing more on like how has indigenous cuisine evolved over time in Tiwa territory and in Palestine with things like ingredients and um, dishes themselves or like accessibility. Um, so yeah, Justine, if you could start with that and then we'll move on to Fezi. Yeah, so indigenous cuisine uh, evolving over time um, has much to do with our continued survival in the colonial constructs in the settler state and um and really just adapting to survive you know uh one of the something that's like a i guess i would consider a pan-indigenous traditional food would be like fry bread you know which comes from commodities given to us by the u.s government because they cut our ties and they cut our relations and they corralled us onto reservations um, specifically to cut our ties with the land and our ability to sustain ourselves from the land. And uh, that's an act of genocide, is uh, severing those connections. And it's, um, and it, it's, and, and therefore indigenous people have to, um, or have adapted to survive. And so that's how we see like indigenous cuisine evolving over time. 
Um, and so now I say that we're in a place where um, we're thriving with, um, with the work that's being done around food sovereignty right now. Um, I, I feel like, um, and I've only been involved in the Red Nation for, you know, since 2017. And I've only really been involved with like doing this sort of work, uh, not very long, but I can't help but feel that like there has been a resurgence of uh, food sovereignty and it's at the forefront of, of Pueblo movement right now. There's so much work going on around it. And uh, even with just, um, even with um, indigenous chefs um, in the United States, across the United States, are bringing indigenous cuisine um, to, to like the general public even. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, I just um, was always like, oh, there's no indigenous restaurants. You know, there's no, um, there's nowhere that serves feast food. And I always thought that was like a cool idea. Wouldn't it be cool if I could go to a restaurant, a modern restaurant uh, that just serves Pueblo food? And uh, I didn't see that until uh, maybe, until uh, the Pueblo Harvest Cafe that is at our Indian Pueblo Cultural Center here in Albuquerque. Um, that's like, that's the first of its kind thing. And um, I'm not sure how old it is, but it's definitely, um, I think I, I want to say um, it was established when I was in high school. And so uh, I, that's when I had seen something like that for the first time. And the chef there, um, he uses uh, indigenous foods to um, to make his dishes, to make modern dishes. In fact, I uh, used one of his recipes last year when I grew the Pueblo squash. He made a squash bisque that had the bisque, uh, or you make a bisque from the squash, and then you add amaranth seeds into that, and that's comp that is truly an indigenous dish because those are indigenous foods that were grown, and um, and then he also, but he also includes um, into his cuisine um, indigenous foods from other parts of the United States. He's uh, from one of the tribes up in the Great Lakes too, and so he uses ingredients from that region of the United States, um, you know, in combination with uh, Pueblo ingredients. Um, but yeah, um, and then right now with indigenous cuisine, uh, even my own cuisine, I would just say that it's evolved to the point where it's really a lot. It's really just all reclaiming and trying to preserve and learning how to um, and learning how to use these ingredients. Because uh, just like what Fadi also said, um, sh it, the the food the actual food the is like half the work the other half is the growing the food and learning how to grow the food and preserving the seeds and the entire agricultural you know indigenous um i don't want to say industry but i guess <laughs> just the whole uh structure of what it is of what we have to do to even be able to grow these foods and this isn't on an industrial level either this like i said this is going on in people's backyards this is going on at uncle's fields in, on the res you know this is this is where we're growing our foods um even in um outside of santa clara where i'm from a bit up north from albuquerque um, the Tewa Women United, they reclaimed a piece of land in the border town of Española and created the Healing Foods Oasis, you know, and that was fairly recent as well. So, yeah, um, I would say the evolution of indigenous cuisine is hopeful because there's a lot of people who are are preserving that um, that knowledge and who are continuing that work and who are uh, who are just gun ho about all of this and I'm here for it. So, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. Um, Fabi, do you want to touch on that? How um, indigenous cuisine has evolved over time in Palestine? You kind of mentioned it a bit before with like how different like diaspora groups have like retained different dishes, which I think is incredible. Uh, but yeah, if you want to talk more about that. Actually, I, what Justine was saying is, is very interesting on the adaptation of food 500 years into colonialism and how jello becomes part of uh, indigenous food. Um, but, but that cafe you mentioned, Justine, I think the, that chef is a hero. And what we need are heroes. Um, the 
most heroic part of, of what you mentioned, I, I was listening to in fascination, is it's actually a cafe, which means it's sustainable. Because what we have to remember is our farmers and our foragers are not a toy. It's not about a one-time shot. It's not, let's preserve the panda of WWF. What they need is constant daily support. They need to be able to sell their produce every day. They need to be able to live in dignity and not be used just for a one-time pro-Palestinian event that looks cool. Um, I And that's part of how our food evolved. What happened, I think, with our cuisine, what we have to remember is most geographic and population movement changes happened in Palestine between 1890 and 1967. So there was the Nakba, then the Naksa in 67, uh, which created the Palestinian refugees, but then there was the commercial or political um, exiles before that. And what it created was a disconnect of people with their livelihoods, with their the lands. Um, the most flagrant one is, of course, the connection with the sea, uh, which was lost for a lot of places, and then very quickly gentrified by the occupiers. Um, we sadly sometimes fell into that trap where, just like with Native American indigenous communities, either consciously or unconsciously, we played the colonial role that was expected of us. We put up shows for the occupier with our cuisine. So our cooks, our chefs, went to cook in Israeli restaurants to make hummus, to make falafel, because that was one of their only survival ways but also we attracted, and I remember before the construction of that wall, when Israelis would come to the West Bank and you know have a ball out of having a Palestinian meal. But what was that Palestinian meal? Was it really our cuisine? Of course not. It was something that was reshaped. It was a bit like the jello. It was reused to fit that colonial conception of what our cuisine is. What happened to us, I think, in the last 10 or 15 years is that we've realized how important preserving our cuisine is. And if you look at, for example, Palestinian cookbooks, the first Palestinian cookbook to have been published was done by somebody called Christian Nasser from, from Bethlehem, actually, around 15 or 16 years ago. Today, you do have more Palestinian cookbooks available. People are really starting to understand how important it is to document this, actually for us not to end up at the situation that Justine and her people are going through, which is there's this gap of a break that was done by the colonial oppression where the recipes disappeared, the ingredients disappeared because they were forbidden to plant them, because they were forbidden to use them. Hunting, I mean, hunting in Palestine was always part and parcel of our livelihood. I mean, can you imagine today a Palestinian running around with a hunting gun? Not really. The, the, he or she would be called a terrorist in three seconds. I mean, so there is, there are mechanisms that are put in place to disconnect us from our food origins that are there under different appellations. There's the appellation of security, there's the appellation of environment. You know, the, the, what, one of the things that boggles my mind is when the Israelis claim they're preserving our environment by forbidding us to forage certain herbs. What are Israeli settlements? If we look at them from an environmental perspective, they are, of course, they're illegal, they're stolen Palestinian land, but if we look at them totally from an environment perspective and solely from that, they are natural lands that have been, the trees that were on them were uprooted and replaced by concrete buildings. So how can this occupying force claim they know better to preserve our environment when their building 
la concrete blocks on our stolen land over our water reserves. It's a bit like, again, I, I make the parallel, you know, it, it's the superiority of the occupier that wants to civilize, quote unquote, us, Justine and my people, the barbarians. No. And, and that's the same. We have another layer, which is the international organizations. A lot of international aid organizations that have intervened in the field of agriculture um, with the claim to support Palestinian farmers, what do they in reality do? They make us capable of creating vegetables, fruits, and, and plants for, the, for export markets that are replacing our native crop, that are replacing our market needs. You know, we grow chives in Palestine now. We've never used chives in our cuisine ever, traditionally. We grow peppermint. We've never really used peppermint, and we're not allowed to pick zata. So this is really where our cuisine has changed because of this. I mean, I, I, I just, I, I find it extremely funny when Palestinian chefs post these fantastic pictures of something called Kalayat Bandora, which is a fry up of tomatoes and onions, and they're using cherry tomatoes in their Kalayat Bandora, while the native tomato is not a, a cherry tomato, and actually cherry tomatoes are one of these seeds that are industrially produced by an Israeli company, and every time you plant one, you're paying royalties back to that Israeli company. Why are we doing this to ourselves? So we have a share of responsibility on what is, how do we preserve our cuisine? And, and I need to, to make clear, I am not a defender of traditional cuisine. I actually think our cuisines, indigenous cuisines to be able to survive have to be modernized because part of modernizing our cuisines is thinking the essence of the cuisines and therefore the indigenous squash that Justine uses or her friend, the chef at that cafe uses, when he does a biscuit with it, he's actually rethinking how to use a native crop. And that's how we also preserve our cuisines. W one last thing which Justine touched on, which I think is, is great, is indigenous restaurants across the United States. Because part of preserving our cuisine and, and reclaiming our cuisine is also sharing it with others, is promoting it to others. Because part of promoting it is actually telling the real story. When we'll have 10 Palestinian restaurants in London, New York, and, and in Tokyo and Paris, we'll be able to tell our story and not have it told by the mouth of the occupier only. And especially now, you know, there are so many restaurants around the world that are like so-called Israeli or American restaurants. So I think even just having those um, different restaurants that you were saying, like reasserting your identity, your culture, like that in itself is a form of resistance. And also ensuring that, um, as you mentioned, that the, the farmers and foragers and like everyone involved in the whole process of um, producing the food, that they're also not only in the world, but they're also benefiting um, from it. I think that's also really important. So um, you, you've both touched on this, um, but both currently and historically, how has food, or I guess the lack thereof, um, been used as a tool of oppression against indigenous communities? So um, you could, I guess, answer that more generally, but also how has indigenous, um, how are indigenous farmers and fishers and other food harvesters livelihoods under threats in these contexts? And, um, you know, with the pandemic going on, that's obviously something that has impacted people too. So if you want to um, touch on that as well, that's fine. Um, we can start with Justine and then move to Fedi for that. Yeah, so um, like I mentioned, um, part of the process of colonization um, here in the United States and elsewhere, uh, including Pal anywhere where there's settler colonialism, <laughs> Um, there is a created dependence on the settler government, on the settler state to, uh, have reliance on them. And, um, and so like, you know, that's, that, that's what I was talking about, you know, um, indigenous people having to adapt to use commodities and then indigenous people, 
uh, having to adapt to, um, you know, through lost knowledge and through um, displacement from the land. And, you know, we have today where we have food deserts where indigenous people don't have access to food because they are uh, 50 miles away at a Walmart. And even if there is food there, uh, even if there is healthy food there, it's food from Walmart, you know, which Walmart is like mass produced, like totally GMOs, like um, sometimes the fruits just taste like water, <laughs> you know, um, like doesn't really taste like fruit or what you think fruit should taste like. Um, and even um i just do i do want to mention about food deserts is um there's also just like it makes food completely inaccessible or, or really inaccessible um when it's even available um when of as i mentioned um in my friend jeff's uh video or movie uh feeding pope he goes into his pueblo store his pueblo grocery store in laguna and he says that it's about uh it's almost seven dollars for just some berries um some strawberries is what he was looking at and yet there's um all of these other like mass produced like cheap um food alternatives there's there's a um there's no shortage of cokes you know on the res but there is shortage of natural foods and 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 those kinds of things um and so food sovereignty is dependent on our land back on land back and caretaking the land um and even if we have access to all of our ancestral lands we'll still be burned in burden with the devastation of colonization and having to clean up after it. And so that's what, um, that is what I had also mentioned earlier was the nuclear contamination of my ancestral lands in Santa Clara and Northern Tewa territory, where, um, you know, um, almost every part of our traditional cycle is contaminated with nuclear, con nuclear contamination. Um, and so I guess that's how I would say that um, how indigenous farmers, fishers, and you know other people who are whose livelihoods are under threat from colonialism, um, it, it's it's from the devastation of colonization. It's from new, it's from um, resource extraction in territory, Tewa territory. It's nuclear nuclear contamination in um, Navajo territory. It's uh, contamination from fracking. You know, and and um and so on. Um, let me see. Yeah, and, I, I think. Sorry. Oh yeah, go ahead. Go sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, I'm just making sure I covered. Um, I'm just I'm just trying to make sure I covered what I needed to cover. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess that's really uh, all I had to say about that was you know just the continuation of colonization, the continuation mm -hmm. of upkeeping the state. Um, you know, through their through their destructive industries, um, and um, until we get stewardship of the land, and uh, are able to caretake the land, able to treat it correctly as a relative, until Indigenous peoples have that rights again, our livelihoods will always be under threat, and we'll always yeah. be living in our own genocide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's I mean that's the sad truth of it, but yeah, that's the truth of it, um, and I think that you know, obviously colonialism is inherently oppressive. So, and then food, of course, is so necessary um, for life, obviously, and like livelihoods. So I think that it's, it's the connection is, is right there. Um, I've seen this photo. I'm not sure where it was um, in the US, but there was a photo like in like, like a black and white photo. So it was an older photo of um, a, a lot of like bison skulls. And like, this is like huge mountain of bison skulls. And this man is standing next to it. And the, the pile is maybe like as tall as like, I don't know, like six or seven people stacked on top of each other. And it's just, it's disgusting. It's a, it's just a huge pile of skulls of bison. And um, American settlers specifically did that so they could target indigenous communities because they knew that that was a, you know, a food source for people. And I think that to me, like summarizes it so well, like how food has been used as a tool of oppression and how it can be used as a tool of oppression in different colonial um, societies, because it's, it's just so insidious and so like, it's such a specific goal to literally like commit genocide, you know? Um, and obviously 
doing that through food has unfortunately been very effective for people. And I think that's why through food sovereignty, that's you getting a lot of, um, you know, the resistance and getting a lot of the, the strength, I guess you could say back. Um, Fanny, um, how, what would you say, um, how has food been used as a tool of oppression um, against indigenous communities in Palestine and how are um, Palestinian farmers and fishers and other food harvesters livelihoods under threat in these contexts? I mean, the, the two most obvious ones in today's times are the fishermen in Gaza, where the Israeli occupation limits the miles they're allowed into the sea. And it changes. It changes on the whim of the Israelis. So, so very often um, people cannot access deep waters and therefore cannot access quantity and quality of fish. And they end up getting whatever is left. So if you look at the Gaza market today, what you're getting is sardines, while in, in this season you have around eight or nine different species of fish that are accessible. Um, and the other one which is linked to the annexation of the Jordan Valley is how Bedouin communities are not allowed grazing land for their sheep and not allowed access to the water ponds, the natural water ponds. Um, a lot of the natural water reserves have a barbed wire around them and an Israeli water company called Mikarot extracting that water and sending it off to the settlements rather than being open air and accessible to the sheep of, of the Bedouin communities. Um, the, <coughs> the, the reality um, of how food has been used as a tool of oppression is also seen on a daily basis in the West Bank with the olives. Uh, what do settler communities do very often, and this is happening on a daily basis mostly in the north of the West Bank, around Nablus, Salfit, and Tubaz, they uproot or burn olive groves. It, when, when you look at the cycle of life of an olive tree, it takes at least five to six years to start bearing fruit. Most of our olive trees are not 10 years old. They're a few hundred years old. When they're uprooted, you're actually forcing whole villages to lose their livelihood. And, and then where do those people work? They end up working as cheap labor in Israeli settlements. Very often, sadly, in the farming industry that they're denied to have on their own lands. One of the most blatant examples is south of Bethlehem in a village called Khirbet Skaria, which has 600 Palestinians living in it. They are traditionally farmers, and their cow shed has been limited. So they have, I think it's something like 40 cows right now. Everybody who is working on that farm today works next door on a settlement built on their land in a cow farm that has 800 cows. It's there. I mean, these are daily examples of how food sovereignty is used and denial of access to land and food is used as an economic repression tool. Um, the other way this has been used by the Israeli uh, government is, I, I think they, they built a fantastic trap called the hummus falafel trap, which we fell into. And by having the Israelis claim hummus and falafel is theirs, we started trying to defend hummus and falafel, which are, by the way, not Palestinian. Hummus and falafel are shared between us, the Syrians, the Lebanese, the Jordanians, and a bit the Egyptians under a different form. And during those 70 years, they had the leisure to market everything else that is Palestinian food as Israel. While we were trying to defend the hummus and falafel bit, our ma'luba has been stolen, our musakhan has been stolen, our frika has been stolen, our olive oil has been stolen, our zata, I mean, the list is a long list. Um, so it's not only the, the physical denial of access to food, but it's also the cultural denial or the tra travesty of food origin uh, that makes it disappear. Because at the end, we as Palestinians are, are less and less 
using our traditional foods because of the, the lack of access, because of the difficulty of being able to transport food between places. And we go towards the, you know, the, the Coca-Cola Justine was, was mentioning. We go towards ready-made cheap foods very often coming from Israeli factories, but also from international global factories and Palestinian factories. And we forget that you know, hummus doesn't come in a box. Hummus starts with dried chickpeas. Uh, Musakhan doesn't come in a freezer, freezer, frozen bag. And most Palestinian very often, because there's one other layer which is very important, which we need to remember, it's gender-based. Who are the food actors? They're women. They've traditionally been women. In a culture like ours, where our food traditions were not written and documented, who have been the guardians of our culinary tradition? Palestinian women. And very often in foraging or farming communities, who is the, the, the hard worker of the story? It's very often the women who pick the, 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 the crop and also are the ones that come into the cities to sell the crop. Um, and these are the most fragile people in our population. And they're the ones that are being denied their empowerment through their, their livelihoods. Yeah, and I think um, kind of like what you were mentioning before, like, you know, uh, part of colonization is a lot of times colonizers will claim that they somehow know the land better and they can take care of the land better. But, you know, if you're taking out all these food resources and if you're disempowering people, um, you know, obviously they're not taking care of the land well. And obviously the people who are indigenous to the land and who the land actually belongs to or who are originally from that land, I should say, um, you know, obviously there are the best caretakers of that land. Um, so yeah, it's also important too, when you're saying how there's obviously the huge gendered aspect that goes along with um, food. And a lot of times Israel tries to portray itself as like so feminist and progressive, but you know, if you're punishing Palestinian women, then obviously that's not feminism. It's, it's supposed to be for all women. Um, so I would love to talk to you guys <laughs> for so long about this, but um, we have to go into the Q and A session. So, but thank you so much for that. Um, I learned so much, and I love this conversation. Um, so now we're going to open the floor up to some questions from our audience, um, and we'd love to answer all of your questions. But just due to the time limit and number of attendees, we might not be able to. So, apologies in advance. Um, I'll go ahead and read the question. So, first question is from Tamara. Um, the question is, Fadi, what are your thoughts on Yotam Otolengi? Most Palestinians and Arabs buy his food and cook his recipes, whilst others feel uncomfortable. But in my experience, perhaps don't always have the language for why they feel this discomfort. Can you help articulate this? Uh, it's a complicated one. Um, what do I think of Yotam Ostrelenki's cuisine? I don't know. I never tried it. Um, <laughs> what do I think of it is really like Yotam Ostrelenki cooking his, his version of Cuisine. I don't think Yotam Otolenghi cooks Palestinian food. He does use Palestinian ingredients. What we have to remember is he has a partner called Sami Tamimi, who is Palestinian, who's just published a book called Palestine, a cookbook. Um, in the context of the UK, where they, they are doing business, um, I did look up quite clear that he was for the Palestinian right of existence, so for two states, which we were asking for as Palestinians, um, and the right of return of refugees. I mean, he, he had the right politics. Um, I would like to see Yadam Otolenghi put a label on Frika and say it's Palestinian. I would like to see Yadam Otolenghi actually, th that issue of provenance that I was mentioning earlier is important. Um, why do we feel as Palestinians uncomfortable? There's two reasons. One is maybe because we didn't realize that Yota Motolenghi has a Palestinian partner called Sami Tamimi uh, until he published his book. And now Sami's book is, has become a, a reference of modern Palestinian cuisine in the last year since it's been published. Um, but also I think we have to realize Cuisine is not always an activist role. 
first and foremost, cuisine is about, in the restaurant setting, is about sharing food, a story, and pleasure. And maybe that's what Yoda Motolenghi managed to do and we failed to do in the UK setting for years until people recently started doing fantastic work. And if we look, there's a, a pop-up um, happening in London called Zad Dinner Club. She's doing fantastic work, but it's been you know the last four or five years. And she's telling the story of Palestinian food without really being an actor. I mean, she doesn't have a humongous Palestinian flag hanging over her meals. And that's not the, not the role. That's where I joined what I was saying earlier. We need to raise the flag of our food, not only to us and to people that are our in solidarity with us, but actually food is the best diplomacy tool ever because we can share it with everybody. I can, Justine can invite me and I can be in the, in the Pueblo cooking Palestinian food and telling people sharing the stories which are in common between our us as people but also very different i and they don't need you know justine doesn't need to round up people that are only pro-palestinian for that event and vice versa she can come here with her friend from the restaurant and cook to palestinians who don't know much about native americans and their, their story but through food it could be a fantastic vehicle i think that's part of our problem because we associated with Palestine, very often we were afraid of rejection. So if you look at Palestinian restaurants abroad, very often they're called Mediterranean or Middle Eastern, while the Lebanese call them Lebanese restaurants. The Syrians call them Syrian restaurants. And I think we, part of our subconscious, you know, I, I, I would want to just simplify it and say, read White Mask, Black Mask, Franz Fanon. You know, I mean, we, we're a typical example of, of the colonized people where we, we lost pride of who we are, and today we're reclaiming it, finally, in the last 10, 15 years. Yeah, um, for I, I'm Haitian, my background, uh, I'm from Haiti, and that's something that I've seen so many times with Haitian restaurants too. They're very rarely called Haitian restaurants, but they're usually just Caribbean restaurants. And I think it's the same thing of like, I think, unfortunately, a, a lot of Haitians, like we see whatever is from us as bad or like, it's like the effect of colonization on your own mind and I guess um, identity in that sense. Um, but, sorry, Haiti, I didn't know you were Haiti. Haiti yeah, is yeah. a fantastic example of Palestinian diaspora. Mm -hmm. Because not only did the Palestinians in Haiti go on cooking Palestinian food, but they creolized it. So yeah. our Patayer Sabaner became Beignet Pinach. I mean, it's a fantastic example of how we managed to preserve our culinary identity while integrating into, into places like Haiti, where, I mean, environment-wise, it's totally different than Palestine. People arrived there 100 years ago, and they managed to integrate. And as far as I know, that you've had fantastic Palestinian cooks in Haiti having restaurants and bake, notably a bakery that was quite good in that was Palestinian, with Creole names for all of our recipes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's incredible. I actually didn't know that, but that's, that sounds uh, really cool. Um, so the next question is from Mehdi. The question is, are there any connections you can draw between food cultures and sovereignties amongst indigenous populations, as you've discussed, and struggles against agribusiness, for example, in India and Latin America? Um, so whoever wants to start with that, I guess you can... Go ahead. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question yeah. one more time? Yeah, the question is, are there any connections you can draw between food cultures and sovereignties against, uh, sorry, amongst indigenous populations, as you've discussed, and struggles against agribusiness, for example, in India and Latin America? Okay. If, if I'm sorry, I'm taking some time to think on that one. I'm not sure how to answer it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's fine. Um, I guess we could we could always go on to an, another question, too. Um, I guess I, I think the question is mainly just connecting, uh, yeah, like food sovereignty with struggles against agribusiness, which you, you, you've kind of, uh, Justine, you've touched on that before with, um, in the U.S., like um, different businesses, um, I guess, like something like Monsanto and like the control they have over like what people can grow or not. Um, so I, I yeah. don't know if you want to like expand on that. 
that's exactly where my mind goes on sort of um like how Monsanto has like taken the sacredness of corn, you know, to mm-hmm. to what it what it is just a genetically modified um hardly even corn, not even considered sacred um sort of plant or uh substance. Um I remember one time I, I feel like one of the one of the bigger realizations I ever had was um, through the agricultural industry of um, producing um, GMO corns and stuff like that and and producing them in the masses that they're produced. They're never once even uh, held by human hands, which in indigenous culture, um, there's an entire, from seed to corn, uh, from seed to corn to, to when it's done, there's an entire uh, cycle of it that's considered sacred, and you know, and it's a very, very um, like communal sort of like engagement in growing corn, and harvesting corn, and um, producing from it, and um, and so I imagine, um, and so. Oof, I'm sorry. I'm not sure where to go from there. <laughs> no, it's fine. No, that's, <laughs> but I'm trying yeah, to answer the second yeah. part of the question. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, that in itself is fine. I feel like that definitely gives us something to think about. Um, Fadi, do you have anything to add to that? Just kind of the connections between like... It's it's the same struggle. The mm-hmm. Indian farmers that have been protesting at the gates of Delhi for the last few months, the Palestinian forager who's denied picking Gakub, Kundalia, or the Native American being denied the sacrality of, of their corn, it's the same struggle. It's about our link to the land, our respect to the land, because the difference between agribusinesses and real indigenous small-scale farming is how we deal with the land. They see the land as how much yield they can get by square foot, what we see with the land is the blessings we're getting from it, whatever the shape is. Whether you're a farmer in Bihar waiting for your rice crop in, in a draw season or you're a Palestinian foraging zappa, same thing. Um, and I think that's essential to all of food reclaiming and sustainability is how we deal with things, how we see things. Um, when I was saying earlier, we, we as chefs need to remember that without the farmers and the foragers, we don't exist. Um, but how do we deal with farmers and foragers? We don't negotiate prices. You don't drive prices to rock bottom because then you're pushing them to use pesticides and insecticides and buy Monsanto's and, 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 you know, produce yields. Um, that's the and and that is global and that's common to all of us wherever we are as indigenous people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I think it's important to connect the struggles in a like internationalist way, because the, the struggles, like you said, they are the same. Um, those struggles for you know working people, for indigenous people, um, for food sovereignty globally. Um, the next question is from Sabiha. The question is, dear all, it is clear from this precious conversation that the question of food is a transnational and decolonial matter. I wonder if, in addition to settler colonialism, you also face the violences that come from liberal white consumer ethics related to veganism, organic food, etc. Also, I love Zatar, especially Palestinian mix, and cheers to Abdel Halim Hafez. <laughs> so, um, I, I don't know who wants to start with that. Fadi, you can start with that question if you'd like. Well, thank you for noticing the this cover in the background. <laughs> um, the, you know, veganism, organic, I mean, organic, it's a fantastic creation. Um, what is organic? And, and I'll tell you a story to actually answer this question. Years ago, a young British man showed up here and and came to me and said, oh, but I want to talk about permaculture and organic production. And so I, I took him off to a drive to Sabasia, which is a small village um, north of Nablus, two and a half hours away from here. 
And I introduced him to a friend of mine who has an olive grove. I told him, look, this, this you know, 25-year-old agronomist wants to teach you about organic. Uh, and they went off, and I, I stayed back, and they went off in the field, and they came back half an hour later, and my friend laughing his head off, and say, you know, patting the, the guy on the back and saying, you know, we've been doing organic for 4,000 years. We didn't wait until you have a certification that says it's organic to make it organic. Uh, I think that what which he's referring to and what we feel in this violence is actually again linked into a colonial vision of things because what we have to remember colonialism doesn't have to have the shape of an occupier only there's colonial thought and a lot of modern labelings are actually looking at us the locals, the indigenous populations, as, oh, well, they don't know what they're doing. Not true, sorry. We've preserved the Roman terraces in Betir since they were built, and people in the village of Betir still grow the best eggplants ever. We didn't wait for a label that says organic. We didn't wait for... Now, veganism is a different story. Because of our faith-based cuisines, we do have periods of the year where people eat vegan food, which is Lent for Palestinian Christians. And a lot of the first meals people eat in Ramadan, just after the end of the fast, are vegan, because when you've been fasting for you know, 16 hours, you're, you need a very light meal to be able to restart your digestive system. So for me, I don't perceive veganism as something that comes from the West, uh, but rather, I think veganism is, is part of our daily process. Have to remember, and in some of the Sufi communities, the, the diets were vegan and, and vegan only. Um, but for the my problem with with food with with our food tradition, when people come and look at us with that perspective of vegetarian, vegan, or meat-based, um, I don't think not eating meat is going to solve the, the world problem of, of, of you know, food scarcity and, and, and access to food. But I, I think eating meat like we do in Palestine, where we use the whole animal or, or half an animal, is is more eco-friendly and responsible rather than buying a piece of steak that's identical to the 600 others that are sitting in a supermarket on a shelf anywhere else because to get those you've killed 600 animals um using stock that comes in powder is a crime buy your meat with the bones and make your own stock that's what our grandmothers and gra gra great grandmothers did and that's where we're more environmentally responsible. So yeah, that bit I do have a problem with people coming and telling you, oh, but no more meat. We're going to save the planet. No. <laughs> we're going to save the planet by using the whole animal, head to tail. We're going to save the, the planet by eating all of our vegetables. Don't cut off the leaves of your carrots. Use the whole root vegetable. You know, this is where we have a responsibility. Yeah, definitely. And I think also um, a lot of times when we hear conversations about like veganism being the only thing that's going to save the planet, although obviously like it could be helpful, but and um, but at the same time, you know, that really removes the role that large corporations play um, in large companies like who are actually destroying the planet. And it's not as much of an individual decision on like whether I should have a steak or a salad. Um, but uh, Justine, do you want to comment on this? Yeah. Um, as far as like um, veganism as like a traditional like method, it's not really um, something like it's just it's just not like the head of our culture, you know, here mm -hmm. here. But as far as like uh, as far as our indigenous culture, but the settler like Western like construct of culture. Um, I hate veganism <laughs> because it, it it's like it, like you said it is sort of um it it's presented as like a way to like save the planet or to be um you know be kind to animals or or whatever or whatever it is 
Um, but it's always it's always uh, presented as like it's an individualist like way to like save the planet, which that is not how the planet's going to be saved at all. It's not through individualism, and and it's also does it also like sort of takes away the credit of um, of world devastation from you know industries like the U.S. military, which is like the world's largest polluter in the entire world. And um, and it also doesn't consider um, that that veganism isn't a nonviolent way to consume. It's not. There's no aspect of it that's not nonviolent because all the majority of all um, you know of all vegetables and and agricultural um, the 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 people who are producing our food are migrants who are working in just horrible conditions who are paid getting paid like nothing who have to meet a quota that you know in the middle of a pandemic and it's just like who is where in this equation is there non-violence you know and it's sort of like veganism here in the west like just like absolves like all these white liberals from you know engaging in violence and it's actually like pretty sinister that it's that they're making these claims when no, there's definitely. a whole like path of violence on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Like you were saying, there's so much violence for um, migrant people and just like the people who are harvesting the food, there's so much violence there. And just by saying that there's no violence for animals, therefore there's no violence at all. I think that also shows how people see the people who do harvest food as like, they see them as like almost less than animals. Like it, as long as the animals are fine, then it doesn't matter what happens. So yeah, I think it's, um, I don't know what, an, uh, I guess an answer would be to like a, maybe like some sort of more like, I don't know, conscious consumption. That's a term I'm making up, but, um, you know, something <laughs> I think would be better instead of just like using veganism as some sort of like answer to everything. Um, so our last question is, uh, what does food sovereignty look like to both of the speakers? Um, so we can start with Fadi for that and then move to Justine. What does food sovereignty look like for me? Do you have another hour and a half? <laughs> yeah. Um, to, to make it quick and short, having access to our land, because I think that's the essence, and having respect to our traditional farming. Um, because you said that they don't see the migrants speaking with the vegetables actually or they see them less than animals my, my perception is they don't see them at all people think that the vegetables go from the plant into the supermarket shelf without anybody touching them um, we've forgotten the tea pickers of india and we've forgotten the um, mexicans in the united states and the palestinians in israel working hard to get these large food production industries uh, to serve you your strawberries all year round and your you know, carrots all year round or whatever. Uh, how I see food sovereignty? Don't use quinoa, except from an, a responsible, sustainable producer, because we've made most Peruvians die of hunger because it's unaffordable, but it's sexy in a restaurant in London, Paris or New York. Um, when you buy frica, if you're in the US or in the UK, buy it from a sustainable Palestinian producer. Um, and for chefs and people from my industry, food sovereignty, never negotiate prices of what you're buying. Remember the dignity of the farmers and the foragers. And I think if we get just to that, we'd, we'd have achieved you know, quite a bit of food sovereignty and responsibility. Yeah, that's a great answer. When when you were saying about um, that people just erase the the farmers and harvesters, I, I definitely actually, that I think that's a better explanation. I know like um, this past summer when there were the fires in California, um, like Northern California, there were photos that I saw of people still um, harvesting grapes when there was literally fire in the background behind them. And that that's something that, I mean, there's there's so many layers to that, like even why the fires were there to begin with. But like, that's something that I think 
summarizes the the issue so well. It's like that's how much we don't see them as we we just expect that people should just keep keep harvesting, you know, grapes <laughs> or keep harvesting strawberries, just keep working because that's what people, you know, that that's what the consumer wants. And I think it all comes back to capitalism as well because that's the the drive for all of this is that people are like, "Well, I, I need I need it for this profit." Um, and people are completely erasing the human beings um, along the line. Um, and I, I remember I was talking to a friend of mine one time and I was saying something about, you know, like to like taste fruit in a supermarket before buying it. And they were saying, oh, no, I, I don't like when people do that because I don't want anyone to have touched my food. But I was telling them, like, so many people have touched your food. <laughs> like, that's normal. <laughs> like, how else would they have picked your food um, without touching it? But, yeah, there's definitely a huge disconnect for where our food even comes from. Um, but, yeah, Justine, um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, what does food sovereignty look like for you? Yeah, food sovereignty ultimately is just land back. It's like plain and simple land back to indigenous people, reestablishing indigenous people as stewards of the land and uh, to reestablish that connection and caretaking that has existed for time immemorial, you know. Um, and also, uh, I guess what food sovereignty looks like to me um, as a member of the Red Nation, I'm going to go ahead and plug in uh, the Red Deal because we've writ we spent a lot of time writing for the Red Deal and um, the Red Deal is going to be published this uh, next upcoming month on um, April 20th. We're going to be publishing it as a book, but um, we have, um, I contributed writing to the Red Deal and um, as part of the Pueblo Feminist Caucus, the caucus within the Red Nation. We've uh, written, we've also contributed as a caucus to the Red Deal about, um, uh, to part three, Heal Our Planet. And it's basically just an outline of, um, of what we're trying to do as an organization to, um, to achieve sovereignty, to achieve liberation, to achieve uh, land back and all those sorts of things. Uh, I highly encourage people go out and read it, look it up, uh, see what we have to say at therednation.org because that's really, um, because those are the blueprints to how we think that we are going to achieve indigenous liberation. And it's through mass movement building. It's through getting on, it's getting on the same page with the rest of the world. It's building, building solidarity with other um, indigenous peoples throughout the world. It's building solidarity with Palestinians because um, ultimately these systems of capitalism, colonialism and, um, and colonization, these are the things that will uh, that will end us, that will end our ability to um, sustain ourselves, end our ability to even uh, grow foods, end our abilities to even um, to subject humans to um, working in conditions like that. You know, when comes the day when there's no more land to plant, you know? And so um, really just stopping these, colonial constructs and and structures like stopping it in their tracks is the only way that we're ever going to achieve um not only food sovereignty but really sovereignty of any and any any and every kind and so i that but that begins with land back and really just giving the land back to indigenous people leaving it up to indigenous people to reestablish their connections with the land and um and how to caretake it from here on out. We have a lot to clean up. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a, that's a really great um, place to end actually, because yeah, just, I think the most important, I guess, takeaway from this talk, if I had to choose one <laughs> takeaway would be like how much food sovereignty is part of, like you were saying, like land back, like the, that's the main issue. And that's the main issue um, with people suffering with colonization is that the, the land has been taken from them and they are being oppressed, um, but it, land is such a central part of it. Um, and of course, food goes along with that as well. Um, so yeah, we've reached the end of our talk today. Thank you both so much um, for giving your time and fascinating insights. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, thank you also to Uprooted and Rising um, and thank you to everyone who's joined us for your time, engagement and questions. 
If you've enjoyed today's talk, please share our activities with your communities, join us at upcoming events, and follow us on social media. Our social media handle is at McKenWrites on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And thanks again for joining us. Um, thanks again to our speakers. And um, I hope you'll all join us again for our upcoming events. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.